Welcome to the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Board, the Credit Union Advisory Council. I'd like to turn it over to Director Cordray for a few comments. I'd just like to uh, welcome everyone. This is the public session of the Credit Union Advisory Council. Uh, these are folks who have uh, applied and been uh, chosen uh, with a lot of input from around the country. They bring us considerable perspective uh, about uh, how the work of the CFPB potentially affects credit unions, how they're finding uh, issues and, and uh, uh, situations in their markets. Uh, any input that they want to give us is always welcome. Uh, we're going to have a couple of uh, sessions here this afternoon where we're going to talk about some specific issues, uh, and we welcome uh, the public both here and anyone who, who may be following uh, the meeting publicly. I thought we might have some congressional staff here. Do we have some congressional staff here? So I wanted to acknowledge them. Anyone? There were a couple of RSVPs. Maybe those didn't materialize. But in any event, uh, we, we welcome all of you uh, to the meeting uh, today. Thank you, Director Cordray. As you know, the Bureau um, organized the, the group for credit unions in 2012 for a way for us to be able to provide feedback back uh, on a very concrete basis to the Bureau and the Bureau staff. It's been a it's a, been a great dialogue session with um, the folks around this table and previous folks that served on the uh, advisory council, and we appreciate the Bureau's um, listening ear as we are able to help them uh, form policy and procedures for the industry. And as you know, the Bureau regulates financial institutions over the $10, million, $10 billion mark. But today, specifically, um, in the public session, we're going to hear on a couple of topics um, from Bureau staff. The first topic is going to be on overdrafts and the um, information uh, that, that's coming out on the narratives, and then also on the consumer complaint narrative that's on the website now. And so we're going to be hearing from staff specifically about um, those two topics. And of course, welcome um, the council members to ask questions, comments, uh, exactly like we've, we've been doing all along. And feel free to um, interject as Bureau staff is, is giving us that information. OK, so first off we have, let's see here, Gary Stein and Jesse Leary for overdrafts. Thank you both. All right, thank you very much. Um, so uh, my name is Gary Stein. I'm the uh, program manager for deposits in our markets group, uh, which is a um, kind of product structured unit that sits in our research markets and regulations arm of the Bureau. Um, and uh, Jesse Leary is a section chief in our office of research is here and uh, will hopefully do most of the talking um, this afternoon. Uh, but I wanted to give you an update on our overdraft inquiry that we kicked off in February 2012. Um, and then Jesse's going to um, give you a summary of a data point that we published in July of this year, some updated analysis on overdraft as we continue um, to forge through that. So just to recap quickly, in, in February of 2012, um, we initiated an inquiry into overdrafts. Um, it wasn't a statutory requirement like a lot of the work that was going on in the Bureau at that time, but more a feeling that this was probably the area of greatest interest and noise um, in the, the consumer deposit space. And so we kicked off a couple of major initiatives at that time. We um, had a request for information out to uh, all stakeholders in the general public asking about 18 um, very detailed questions about overdraft programs, how they worked, how the industry and consumers had adapted since um, the Fed and, uh, had uh, made modifications to Reg E in 2010 and, and to, to Reg DD and um, the guidance that the other prudential regulators had released prior to that. Um, and then uh, we got back um, about uh, 1,100 responses, uh, many from individual consumers, but many from credit unions, uh, community banks, uh, large institutions, vendors, trade associations, you name it, um, advocates. 
And uh, it gave us a pretty uh, diverse perspective on overdraft programs, so not a scientific survey, certainly, of, of the industry or anybody. Um, we also initiated at that time uh, what we call our large bank study, where we worked with a several um, uh, large supervised entities to really get under the hood to understand how their programs work, um, not with the expectation that every institution is like a large bank, but more um, because it would permit us to talk at a very granular level about the operational aspects of these programs and how they evolved. And uh, most of that work um, culminated in a, the first round at least, in a white paper that we released in June of last year. Um, and uh, in that paper, we tried to kind of level set for stakeholders and describe fundamentally how these programs work, why uh, uh, we may see issues with um, you know, high fees paid by consumers and what happens to their uh, accounts and so forth, um, and, um, and, and really drew on the research that we collected through the RFI, which, which I should add included a number of industry surveys conducted by trade associations and, and others, um, as well as that large bank study, the first round from that. Um, since that time, we've continued to analyze and collect additional information, um, because in that white paper, I think while we um, probably explained a lot about how these programs work, um, every time I think we identified a specification or something, uh, it, it, it triggered three or four more questions. So why is this? Why is that? And so we, we raised a number of public questions. We didn't feel our analysis had been completed at that time. Um, and so we've been uh, hard at work on that. Um, one of the things that we were able to obtain, though, as part of our uh, large bank study data request was uh, transactional um, information, de-identified with no personal identifiable information, um, but on uh, approximately, I think, 2 million accounts so that we could really observe how the, the combination of these program configurations and consumer transaction patterns resulted in outcomes for consumers. Um, and so the data point we released in July was really the first pass at uh, the results of that. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Jesse right now, and then I can um, follow up after he's done and give you a little bit more update on where we are and some other initiatives and where we're headed. Great. Uh, thanks, Gary. Um, hopefully folks will be able to see the slides as we, as we go along here. Um, to give uh, a little more context, as, as Gary was saying, this is based on data received from a number of, of large supervised uh, banks. Um, the data point we put out in July is a, um, it's a, it's a summary of information about some key points relating to overdraft, um, but it by no means reflects the breadth or the depth of the analysis that we've been doing with, with this data. Um, and I think we, we expect to put out additional, additional analysis um, uh, for the public um, as, we, as we work through this as well. So again, these are, these are a set of initial findings that we think are, um, are important to understanding overdraft, um, but not the, you know, not the, the, not the full breadth. Um, the focus of this discussion is going to be on the relationship between opting in to overdraft coverage uh, on point-of-sale debit and ATM uh, transactions uh, and overdraft fees, um, the distribution across account holders of overdraft fee costs, uh, typical uh, the, aspect, the, the characteristics, characteristics of typical overdraft transactions, and also how long account holders remain negative, how long the balances on accounts remain negative after someone does overdraft. So let me back up. So, so the first point about opting in overdraft, um, I, just to make sure everyone's on the same page with what this means, um, under my, uh, amendments to reg, Regulation E that, that, that um, the Federal Reserve Board put in place, starting in, 20, in July 2010, uh, for a financial institution to charge a consumer an overdraft fee on an ATM withdrawal or a point-of-sale debit card transaction the consumer had to have first had to have first given consent to that, so that's called the opt-in. 
Uh, we, we refer to this as opting in. Um, and the disclaimer, uh, I'm an economist, not an attorney, so if any, if any of what I say is not precise legally, um, I apologize. And, but because I'm an, an economist, not an attorney, you can't hold me to it. Um, so these are summaries of the average monthly checking account fees per account. Um, I apologize for the size of the, of the font for some of the folks in the back. Um, and this shows, this, so again, this is based on account level data from a number of large banks with transaction, where we have detailed transaction information uh, and so are able to, to calculate average, average fees um, at the account level. What this shows, if you look at the, the, the first column, uh, an overall average of, of these, for this set of fees of just under $10 per month per account, um, with just a little more than half of that being overdraft and NSF fees. If you look across to accounts that are either opted in or not opted in to the coverage of debit card transactions and ATM withdrawals, you see that, that there's a pretty dramatic difference in the in the overdraft and NSF fees that are that are paid depending on whether an account is opted in or is not opted in, um, with the the overall the overall fee level being um, about four times higher for accounts that are opted in, uh, and a much larger share of their overall fees being overdraft and NSF fees. Uh, I should say, and that the this isn't simply a direct effect of being opted in. Um, the difference in fees is not entirely due to, is that, the difference in the fees is not just difference in, 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 in fees on debit card transactions and ATM transactions. What we see is that accounts that are opted in tend to have more overdraft fees on all of their transactions. So um, that raises the question of whether this is, this is, this is causal, that being opted in um, causes some sort of knock-on effect that leads to other overdraft fees, or whether it's simply a matter of different account holder behavior um, that, that's correlated with being opted in or not, or not opted in. Um, and that's something that, that we are uh, continuing to look at. The next slide, and I should say all of the um, folks who want to see this in detail and either, either are having trouble, can't, are having trouble seeing the slides or, or just want to have something to take with them, um, all of this is lifted directly from the data point that we put out in, in July and that appears on the Bureau's website. Um, this next slide shows how overdraft, overdraft transactions and overdraft fees are distributed across account holders. Um, what it shows is that for 70% of the accounts that we have data on, there are no overdraft, overdraft transactions um, over, the, over the time period covered by the data. Um, or actually, this is over, over a one-year period. The, the data covers a full um, 18 months. We're looking at, at the last year of the data so that we can put things in, in an annual, on an annualized basis, makes it a little easier to communicate. Uh, so 70% of the, of the accounts don't have any, any overdrafts. Um, a, an eighth, 12.5% have, have a, a very small number, one to three, um, and they pay a, a, quite a small share of the overdraft fees. Uh, and a small share, about 8%, incurs 10 or more overdrafts per year, and that group um, pays the, 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 the majority of the fees, nearly three quarters of the, of, of the overdraft fees. Um, something to note about this is the, the number of overdrafts in, includes overdrafts on which a fee is not charged, and so that's why you'll see the, um, the average fees paid for the group with, with one to three fees is less than um, the, the average cost of overdraft, simply because there are some transactions that, that results in an overdraft, but for uh, reasons related to either um, the type of transaction or the uh, or de minimis policies, et cetera, there's no fee charged on the transaction. The next slide shows the same the same analysis broken down by accounts opted in and accounts not, not opted in. <clears throat> and what we see is that for accounts that are opted in, uh, only about half of them don't have a fee over the course of a year. Um, so a much larger, so a, a, a considerably larger share of accounts 
uh, that are opted in have at least one fee, I mean, I'm sorry, have at least one overdraft um, transaction over the course of the year. Um, and a larger share of those accounts uh, have at least 10 overdraft transactions over the course of the year. Uh, we still see, you know, even, even with the breakdown, we still see that the majority of fees are paid by people who, um, who have a significant number of overdrafts. The next slide, we look at the, the median size of overdraft transactions. Um, and these are transactions on which an overdraft fee was assessed. Uh, and what we see is that, not surprisingly, the size of the transactions differs across the type of transaction. Um, but for some of these types, so, so debit cards, which are the most common type of, are the, the most common type of transaction of, of these different transactions, um, are also the smallest with a median transaction size of $24. So that means of the, of the debit card transactions that lead to an overdraft fee, uh, half of them are $24 or less. And this is uh, for the banks that we're analyzing here, uh, the, the median overdraft fee is $34. Uh, finally, we looked at how long accounts stay negative. So this shows the distribution of, of the length of time that an account stays negative after experiencing overdraft. So what we see here is that for just under 30% of the occasions where an account is overdrawn, uh, the next day the, the balance uh, is brought positive. Uh, the median time is, is three days. So half the time following, following an overdraft, the accounts brought, brought positive within three days. Um, and I believe the statistic for um, a week is 75 or 80%. So within a week, the majority of, you know, the, the solid majority of accounts uh, have come positive again. The, um, the, the, the spike out at 45 days, uh, those, a large portion of those are accounts that have gone negative with an overdraft uh, and are not going to become positive again. They're going to be the, the charged off or abandoned. So to summarize the, the, the key points of our first publication on the, on the account level data, uh, the overdraft fees make up the majority of the, of the fees on, the, on consumer checking accounts. Um, consumers who have opted in for overdraft coverage of their ATM uh, and debit card transactions have uh, much higher overdraft fre frequency and, and pay substantially higher overdraft costs. The majority of overdraft fees are paid by a small share of account holders. Um, and this is something that, that, that's not a, I should say this is, this is consistent with previous research I should point out. Um, many of the overdraft transactions are, are fairly small, uh, especially debit card transactions, which tend to be small over in, in general. Um, the debit card, tra card transactions that lead to overdrafts um, are, are, you know, are, are on average quite small. Uh, and finally, when consumers do overdraft, they typically bring their accounts positive again within a fairly short period of time. So those are the key findings of what, of what we've put out so far uh, and would like, to, would like to invite questions or discussion or comments uh, on this topic. I have a comment. I have a comment. So you, the comment about the... Um, a lot of the overdraft transactions are small. What proportion of the total transactions in an account is small? That is, if it's a random sample and you have a, th a thousand transactions in a month and 80% of those transactions are small, then it stands to reason that 80% of the transactions that cause the overdraft would be small. You see what I'm saying? Sure. And I, I, I believe the... I believe the distribution of transaction sizes that cause overdrafts are similar to the distribution of transaction sizes w within each category. Okay. So, so they're not they're not that's unusual. Not really information, then, right? Well, it's that's not really information then. I mean, you're just, it's a random distribution. Well, or is, is it random or not random? I, the, the implication that one might draw is that uh, one implication one might draw is that you're it's an impulse transaction. People don't know what their balance is. They're getting this fee, a $34 fee for a $20 transaction, and that's a bad thing. We need to do something about that. On the other hand, it might just be that I have a, you know, 100 transactions during a month. 
X percent are small. So if I am having a problem and I overdraft, the one that triggers it is the chance of it being small is, is high, right? I think it's, I wouldn't say it's not information. I would say it's, it's in, in trying to understand what's going on in overdraft, it's, it's important to know whether the, the, the transactions that lead to overdrafts are similar or different than transactions generally. Right, so that's, the, but this doesn't give that to me unless I got a distribution of how, what the transactions are. Okay, that's, that's a useful yeah. suggestion, thank you. Okay. Jesse, I find your, uh, your summary very uh, fair. Uh, I think it's worth pointing out the uh, last bullet though, that when consumers overdraft, they usually bring their accounts positive quickly. Uh, the other point I would make is that had you pulled up that uh, that uh, fee survey uh, and just uh, confined it to the credit union space, you would have found a lot of zeros on that. Thanks, John. C can you remind us how the overdraft study got on your radar screen or why, why it was a study? Uh, okay, so... Um, the concept of overdraft in general being a focus was, it's, it's, it's kind of multi-pronged. Um, I think in, um, in setting up the office for deposits, um, I don't think it was hard to find out where probably there was most noise in the marketplace about, um, uh, you know, uh, consumer anecdotes about and, and complaints even before we started co collecting complaint information and the advocates and the issues they would generally raise would be about overdraft programs. So um, in some ways it was um, um, kind of uh, um, one that was waiting for us, if you would, before we opened our doors. But in addition to that, um, the timing whether or not the Bureau was created would be really appropriate, I think, for any regulator to take a look at this in the sense that um, there had been, over the previous decade, a lot of regulatory activity um, that had geared towards um, modifying overdraft programs um, that most recently, as I said, culminated in the Fed making a couple of regulatory changes in 2010, most notably to require institutions to collect a consumer's affirmative consent um, before they charge a fee on debit card and ATM transactions. And there really had been no post-mortem on that change. If you look at, um, and it, uh, it's a little easier with banks and credit unions because of the details in the public call reports, but if you look at um, bank service charges on deposits, um, you'd see a huge drop-off around the time that these regulations, uh, modifications were made. Now, I don't think we'd attribute all of that drop-off to um, challenges in, in collecting consumer overdraft fees. There was also an economic downturn and people started spending less and things like that. But certainly there's enough noise to warrant attention. Um, the prudential regulators, and I'm sorry if I'm droning on about this, but I can just say two quick things. The prudential regulators, on the banking side at least, um, had all issued guidance that was inconsistent to some degree. And so there was a bit of an uneven marketplace in regular for depository providers in terms of overdraft. So there was an opportunity to even that out. Um, there was research that said consumers were still confused. Um, and... Uh, Oh, and the last point, I think, that also drove to this and drove to some of the regulatory changes were just the fact that consumer transactional patterns have been changing rapidly. So your question about debit cards was a great one because I think a lot of people might have prophesied that when overdraft first started, it was for, you know, you write your big check for your mortgage or something, and you want to make sure that goes through as a courtesy, which I think is very well founded. Um, but when consumers started using debit cards, which are a great convenience um, and advancement in, um, in consumer banking, um, the, the, the nature of all that changed a little bit. And so it's, it's been a bit of a moving target. So can we infer that you're going to look at potential... Uh, changes in policy to treat uh, ACH, ATM, and debit cards differently? I think that remains to be seen a little bit. I think um, one of the reasons ATM and debit cards were 
uh, and I wasn't at the Fed at the time, but uh, I'd rationalized back that they were they were picked out is because the institution has the opportunity um, to authorize or decline those transactions at the time the consumer executes them and could theoretically prevent a consumer from going into overdraft with no NSF fee, um, which is a little different from an eight uh, check or an eight ACH transaction, the way things generally work right now. But I, I'd say, but to your broader question, Robin, um, yes. I mean, the, the point we engaged in this was to determine whether any policy changes are required. And I think um, we went into this with no preconceived objectives to make a specific change. There's been court cases on posting order, among other things. There were the regulatory changes. Would, um, and so I think it we we have a responsibility to have a perspective on all of those things and to determine whether or not what types of changes are required and, and how to execute those. Gary, two two things. The first is, you know, in today's environment, we don't get a lot of thank yous from our members because our deposit rates are, are low. Mm -hmm. But one of the things we do get letters on from our members or calls is to thank us for clearing items through overdraft. Mm -hmm. It is one service that we have given our members that they really like and they really want and we very rarely when we do our member surveys over the year we might get one or two saying the fee is too high or don't charge a fee for it but i usually get thank you it, you, it cleared or we get letters to the second point you know it's been regulated over the years so now on everybody's statement every month they know exactly how much they spend on overdraft a month <laughs> and how much they spend on it on a yearly basis if a member sees that and doesn't want to spend for overdraft all they need to do is call and say, I don't want it anymore. You know, it, it, it's an option that they, they can use or can't use. Nobody's forcing them to use this. And most people like it and know what, know what the fee is associated with it. I mean, yes, there are issues that you have with maybe po you know, people posting different ways and, and, and trying to grab more fees than, they, than they, maybe they should. But everybody is aware of what they're spending a month because they see it in front of them. And if they don't want it, they don't have to have it. But most people don't opt to, to cut it off. So if it's something is working, why do we really, and, and the members really like it, why is there a need to change it? That's a great question. Um, so um, I'd say we, we certainly have a, enough volume of noise on the other end to con, uh, and that uh, others have collected for us that suggest that not everybody feels it's working perfectly. And certainly there are 14,000 depository institutions, so it'd, it'd be f crazy to say that it's, you know, th there's the same level of understanding or everything at every single institution. Certainly many of them, I'm sure many of you all in this room, um, uh, offer um, protections and things for your members that many other institutions may not offer, and so it, it's not even across the board. One of the things that... Um, you know, we raised in our white paper was, okay, we tried to explain uh, how this works operationally. Posting order, um, while it's been in court cases, quickly escalates into some complicated discussion about different types of payment systems. I mean, a checking account, first of all, is a very powerful tool, and uh, and it's a great consumer convenience and, and, um, and provides an opportunity for mobility. It allows, generally, consumers to transact through a lot of different methods, and these methods and payment systems all operate on different time schedules with different rules and things like that. And so it, it, it culminates in the institutions that offer them to have to figure out operationally how do we update account balances for all these different trans transactions and in what time basis and, and in what order. And as a result, there's a lot of operational decisions that, that institutions have to make um, just in that area alone, plus others. And, and so there's a variety of different practices. And as we go through and we see consumers, and one of the reasons we wanted to look at this were to see how do consumer outcomes vary by all these different differences in practices. And so that's one thing that we want to understand. And, and would a consumer that does something at bank or credit union A experience the same outcome that they would at, at credit union B, and why is that difference, and could they anticipate that? 
Um, we also raise questions in our white paper about the level of consumer understanding about these things. To what degree do they anticipate that? Um, to your point on opt-in, I would agree with you. There's certainly a requirement that says consumers have to have the ability to opt back out, although we see few consumers that do that. And so we actually initiated um, some qualitative research uh, earlier this year that's just getting wrapped up right now where we set out to have in-depth interviews with uh, close to 100 heavy and moderate overdrafters um, to understand what, why they do the things they do. We can see what happens. We can see that consumers sometimes overdraft a lot. We can see um, if, you know, we might be able to see what operational practices might contribute to that. But we can't, to your point, which I think is a great one, understand wh why a consumer would do that and, 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 and what choices do they feel like they have. And so that was one of the points of our research. I just want to give you yep. one, one example of that. Um, there was a couple who had, that was a members of our credit union who had several thousand dollars of overdraft fees a year. And we actually sent them letters and called them because we were concerned. They said it's our marriage counselor. We both write checks and we don't want to bother each other or say where is the money. And mm -hmm. we know that we're spending X amount of dollars, but you know what? We pay it back, it saves our marriage, and we don't have to worry about it. Thank you very much. And they, they knew exactly what they were spending, but it, that's the way, they, that's the way they, yep. they, they finance their money. So, I mean, and we brought it to their attention. So there's many different ways why people use it. You know, it, it's, um, it's their money, and we, we let them know what they were spending, and they said, hey, we know. Uh, I would um, urge you as you go through the research, uh, that is 100 interviews. People don't necessarily <laughs> self-disclose. <Yeah>, right. Because <laughs> um, what we found, we have a payday lending program and overdraft privilege, and, and members love it and all that. And what we find when we find what we call the abusers, and we call them like you call them and yeah. talk to them about what's going on, you know, there's lots of behaviors that are going on. And I, for want of a better word, psychological profile. So we've had a very fluent people say, you know, $3,000 with overdrafts, what's going on here? You know, you, you're a smart businessman. You you have multiple businesses, you just say, don't bother me, this is just the way I do it, mm -hmm. essentially was what he was saying. So yeah. um, I think though that research is great. I'm very encouraged that you're doing that kind of research. Uh, continue to do it so you'll understand what that consumer is. We live it every day, so we know these consumers very well. One research project, 100 people, that's not a lot, mm -hmm. and plus the self-disclosure problem is a, is a real one. Yeah. No, I, I, I would agree on both counts. We, we've had some other outside parties provide consumer research to us, and we have other data to draw from, but I, I would agree. I mean, there's a lot of, there, there's there's still, there's always stones to try to unturn. And your your point on consumer acknowledgement, uh, I I would say we wholeheartedly agree with that. And, and in fact, I think it's a challenge in a lot of the issues that we at the Bureau address and that, you know, and, and these types of things. One, will they admit what they're doing? And two, when confronted with an opportunity to change, how realistic might they be about whether they're gonna do it again? And um, and, and those are difficult things to wrap into policy considerations. Two points, yeah. if, I, if I may. The first is that um, the statistics, if nothing else, show that what the Fed put into place in 2010 is working. Certainly the overabundance of transactions are by people who have chosen to opt in. So I think it's fair to draw the conclusion that those who are being charged fees for overdraft are aware of the fact that they're being charged and that they're happy with the program Otherwise, they would not have chosen to opt in or otherwise may have chosen to opt out. I think the second thing that needs to be noted is that the world of payments is significantly changing. And to differentiate between a check, an ACH, and a debit, five years ago may have made a lot of sense. But I think in 2014, bordering on 2015, we're coming to a system where all of those things are blurring. Mm -hmm. Years ago, if you went into a supermarket, you paid the transaction in either cash or you often wrote a check. Mm -hmm and you wrote a check for something that was a necessity for you at that moment in time. How many people write a check in a supermarket in the fourth quarter of 2014? The mechanism of choice is the debit card, at least from what I see. So by looking at a check one way and looking at a debit card transaction another way, you're kind of discriminating against the um, trends of society and the ways the members are starting to use to access their money. I just urge that you be careful that we're using 2014, 2015 banking habits as opposed to thinking that we're back in 10 or 11 years ago because we're not. And, and even if uh, a member writes, even if a member writes a check, 
they're just as likely to hand the check back to the member and treat it as an electronic check. Um, and um, we used to offer a product. We deal with uh, a lot of members um, who've cool. never had a checking account before um, or, and who are having difficulty managing from day to day, week to week. We used to order, offer a product for 25 years uh, called Courtesy Call. Um, and we would call the member by 5 one day and give them until 1 p.m. the next day to make good on a check. But now we, we can't do that. The processing times have changed. We don't have the discretion to uh, check to turn back an ACH or an electronic check. We can do it instantly, but we don't have any, any wait time. So um, we've had to go to other mechanisms, uh, including the courtesy pay instead of the courtesy call. Oh. I wanted Gary, to... I have a question for you. <laughs> Do you all have any data as it relates to how many of these accounts that remain overdrawn for 45 days fall off and are actually charged off, and then those members or those customers no longer have access to, say, mainline financial services, and they are the they become the unbanked. So we, we do have we do have information on whether the account is closed with that institution. Um, we don't have information on what happens with that consumer afterwards. We don't know. We don't we don't sort of we aren't able to, to follow the consumer. This is the, the data we're working with came from, from came from the banks. Um, it so appeared to me that about three percent of those transactions, just looking at your graphic. Mm -hmm possibly would end up well, in that plight. And so uh, that 3% could equate to quite a number of consumers. And so I think that, you know, I, from my experience in the market, it's some of what uh, the, where the objections come from as far as overdraft programs in general are concerned, is that there are a group of consumers who don't really understand that much of what's happening, they like the idea that this month their checks are going to be covered, but they cannot afford the uh, overdrawn account, and when their direct <coughs> deposit or their Social Security check hits, it fills that hole, but it gives them nothing to live on, mm -hmm. so it puts them in a spiral mm -hmm. of negative activity, because next month they're going to start paying bills, and every one of their checks or debit cards or whatever the transaction might be will end up costing them. So uh, I think that should probably be something that would be considered in whatever rules would come out of this study. And, and I got to thank Helen for the for the the plug lead in there um, because actually uh, next Wednesday uh, the Bureau is going to be hosting a forum on checking account access and screening and looking at this ecosystem and the cycle that happens to consumers, um, how institutions determine when and when not to offer a checking account to an applicant, the information they use, um, and then how they report back on consumer activity. And uh, uh, Helen has graciously um, agreed to serve as a, uh, a panel moderator in that event. So <laughs> I appreciate the plug and the, um, the comment there. But I think it's an excellent question and one that I think we'll spend a lot of time talking about next week. Gary, as part of your research, um, did you get down into the weeds as to who uses overdrafts, i.e. Um, annual household income, any kind of um, ethnic, racial, social, yeah, economic yeah. background. Um, because I know the maybe the stereotype okay, is the folks that are being abused are poverty and below, when in fact you may find that it's actually higher income individuals who are using this as a safety net feature or part of how, you know, as Mitch said, save their marriage, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. um, and you may not have the answer to that, which is fine. But if you but if you haven't asked that question, I would. Secondly, <clears throat> did do in this was there a study on the median, okay, merchant fee for a returned item? Because that's important because that is what the consumer is not having to face when we cover their overdraft or a financial institution covers that overdraft transaction. So that is an economic benefit. You know, also a, co a convenience issue, 
but it's also an economic benefit because they're not having now to face the merchant. You know, I, I struggled when, when my credit union implemented courtesy pay, <clears throat> which is enhanced overdraft protection, okay, until I had a member come to me and say, because you offered this, okay, I was two days short of payday, and I was able to get formula for my baby, so paying the fee was not a problem for me. Okay? That opened my eyes. But by the same token, it opened my eyes to those who abuse it, okay, to where, like Kevin and others have said, we pull those members aside to find out what's wrong, <clears throat> and we will put them in financial counseling free of charge to the member. We will pay for that to help them get their accounts straightened out. But they have to do that voluntarily. I can't make them do mm -hmm. that because I've had members say, I know what I'm paying. You don't have a problem with me. Okay? Mm -hmm. So those are things that, you, that won't necessarily come out of the study. Okay? But um, there are abuses, but it's not the evil instrument that I think maybe it has been um, puffed up to be, so to speak. So. Thank, thank you, Jim. I'd like to, to talk about, and I know many credit unions do this as well, but we've had a practice in our credit union for many years that we do courtesy calls for deposits. Mm -hmm. So our branches know these members very well, and so every morning there's a list distributed um, of, of members that have overdrafted, and we give them a courtesy call. Nowadays we send them a text as well, and they have until 5 o'clock that day to make a deposit, and we will not charge them that overdraft fee. Now, you know that that costs the credit union money to, to keep that negative balance. But we believe that we're providing a service. And, um, and members have a choice. And, and I think we've said it around this room. We all probably do financial counseling. We've done that as well. We've helped members that want to get out of that ODP situation and, and give them a small dollar loan to pay back over time so that they can opt out. Um, it's been very few, but we do offer that service. So we are trying to be as proactive as possible and still giving members a choice of how to handle their ODP. I just want to make one point which hasn't been brought up yet is for most people, courtesy pay is a tertiary way of paying a, a charge because we would overdraft first free from a savings account and then we offer a line of credit which we overdraft for free as well. So you have two options with our credit union to overdraft without paying anything. It's only when those two don't have anything available does courtesy pay, you know, hit in, and then a fee is charged. So there are, and we let people know. I mean, you know, in every everything we send out, it will say, remember, you can also use your savings account and a line of credit to cover overdrafts for, for you know, for no fee. So there are alternatives to using courtesy pay and having to pay a fee to, to overdraft. To, to pay for your overdrafts. Uh, I'd like to just ask if what's going to happen if you prohibit us or uh, make it more difficult for us to offer this program, you know, how are our members going to get cash that they desperately need? Have you thought about what those alternatives are going to be and where they're going to go? Uh, I, my credit union's a CDFI. Many of our, you know, two days before payday uh, overdrafts are I'm at the gas station, I'm at QT, and I need gas. We literally sometimes have people calling us to make sure that they can get money out of their debit card. So their abilities to do that, and some of that is because, as you may or may not know, at a gas station, especially QT, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you go in there, they may put a $50 hold on there to make sure that that clears. Mm -hmm. So if they're running very lean and mean in their checking account, yep. that $50 hold plus the 24 bucks that they need for their gas is going to cause them to overdraft. So thoughts also of where would our members go? How are they going to be serviced? And some of the alternatives that are out there aren't very pretty. So, food for thought. Tagging off of that, do you is there any data that says where this money, where these debit transactions are taking place? Like what percentage is for food? For what percentage is for gas? Things that are necessities to life. So, so first of all, I like all the questions, and I like that you don't let us answer them, because. Uh, <laughs> So this this is a this is a great session. We should, I'm sorry there was a pause right there. The um, uh, <laughs> uh, so I'll just answer that last one first. The the um, the data we have 
that we have um, because we we don't have any personally identifiable information. There's some unfortunately things like those merchant codes we we can't see that. We have seen analysis that others have conducted. And as you might expect, it's it's generally quite different if it's happening with a debit card than with a check or an ACH type of payment. As 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 Jesse indicated with the research, those, those transactions, whether they're causing an overdraft or not, tend to be very different. They're used for different purposes, even in some cases where th those lines are starting to, to blur a little bit, but they're still quite different. And so... So I would just say that um, with regard to the, the how overdraft is used, how um, the, the, the benefits of overdraft uh, and you know, the, the consumer's alternatives, those are all things that we're certainly that we need to be cognizant of, need to be thinking about as we're as we're as we're as we're doing the research and thinking about what what good what good policy would be in this area. Um, and so you know, things like transactions that. Are able to be are able to go through that either allows someone to make a purchase that that that's a very very high value to them in the moment, um, or allows them to um, avoid having an NSF situation. Uh, certainly, things that were that we that we're, we're we're thinking about and trying to do our best to understand and 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 incorporate into the into the thinking. Do we have any other questions, Jason? Uh, uh, yeah, these are all great. Um, comments that people have made, it's all about unintended consequences. Yeah. Um, another unintended consequence from changing the overdraft programs as they sit today is our bottom lines. As credit unions, the only way we can grow in our equity position is through earnings. We already naturally have a small or a thinner um, margin. Taking away a fee product um, is going to add a, a larger disparate impact on credit unions as opposed to a larger financial institution that has a lot brighter way, a broader way of making revenue. So um, that's just another one of those unintended consequences that we have to look at from not just credit unions. I think mutual savings banks are probably just set up the same way. So we need to think about all of those. I just had one sort of uh, research question again. I apologize for that. Um, but it gets to some of the comments we've been making here. One of the things I think that from a policy perspective you, is a natural tendency is to look at a discrete project, a product at a discrete point in time. The products we've all been talking about are cash management product, products that are for a, usually a month period or the pay period is. And so perhaps at some future time you can look at that relationship of what's going on over a period of time rather than at a discrete product or a discrete point because then you may get some understanding about what's happening that will inform your policy decisions, if that makes any sense. Uh, maybe. I can. I can. Maybe uh, sometime <laughs> in the future. <laughs> hey, the cash yeah, management. Go ahead. Um, do, do you mean looking at, looking at what's going on over the course of a pay cycle or the course yeah. of a monthly expense cycle and trying to see when, when overdrafts yes. are occurring, how it relates to, yeah. Yeah, it's certainly something we're interested, we're interested in. We've we've um, tried to identify pay cycles. Um, it can be there's some people where you can look at their transaction data and see the pay cycle. The, the issue is you, you refer to the difference between uh, overdrafts with checks and overdrafts with debit, and you see a difference. That difference may just be a function of the the way the individual is, monitor, is monitoring their cash management strategy, and they they pull it right up to the right up to the edge, and it's at the edge where the overdrafts start kicking in. But they've taken care of the big you know, in some cases, big. So you wouldn't know what's going on unless you looked at a period rather than just a discrete point or a discrete product because they're using lots of products. And, you know, figure, if you talk to a consumer, they're, you know, they're using lots of products to keep their house together when they're in this situation. And so you can't, it, I think it might mislead you in terms of a policy decision by not looking at the, a bigger picture. That's all. Uh, you probably don't have the resources to do that, but just if you ever do. Okay. And uh, just from my experience uh, with my members, what my members need to help manage uh, their cash better are better jobs with higher pay. <laughs> if I could just have a little bit of a contrarian view, we we never did courtesy pay. Uh, we we forewent probably forty million dollars in income uh, before Dodd Frank required it, and it did not harm our financial position. Uh, you you learn not to rely on that type of income. 
Um, but I, and I applaud you for recognizing the change in the transaction set, and some of it is societal. Uh, the use of debit cards is obviously a much higher um, uh, usage. Um, but I, I ask a lot of my members, especially young members, would they, um, if they had a buggy full of product at the grocery store or Home Depot, would they rather that the, um, that the clerk um, turn down the transaction and, uh, or that they pay uh, $25, $29 and, um, and, and let the transaction go through? And I get a variety, but I will say more and more young people are actually would prefer that we turn down the transaction. And I think that's because, you know, um, and I always underestimate the number of transactions. I always say, well, how many would use it more than 10 times, a debit transaction more than 10 times a week? And they laugh in my face because they're using it, I think your report showed 17. So some are using it 20, some are using it 30, which also means they're not tracking their balances very well. I mean, we used to actually enter it into our check registers and they, they laugh at that. So I applaud the fact that you're looking at the change in the dynamics, but, I, but they seem to have a handle on the fact that they're prepared to, turn, to have us turn it down, in which case they would opt out. They would say, I don't want you to do that. And then there are some that uh, do. So I don't know if you're headed towards a, a, an additional disclosure uh, requirement or a, a programmatic um, requirement. But I, I do think that the dynamics of the market are changing. Uh, we're here to improve our members' lives. And so I, I certainly, as one member of the, of the council, would not oppose uh, continued education and disclosure uh, as the, the product set and the usage evolves. So appreciate the study. Bob, did you have a comment? One last question, easy one. Um, what percent of members, or I'm sorry, not members, respondents to the survey were opted in and opted out? Uh, oh, you mean the, Overall. the interviews that we yep. conducted? Um, you know, I don't have that figure off the top of my head. To, to Kevin's point earlier, um, uh, there's, you know, the, some sometimes consumers don't always, you have to kind of tease some of this information out of them. We, we couldn't look at their, you know, account information or anything like that um, that might be intrusive. Um, we tried to understand by asking them how they've overdrawn and things like that. Um, you, I think you, you categorized them into opted in or opted out for, for the study it. as best we could. But okay. again, we we can't ver we couldn't verify their account information. We could talk about the the histories and stuff like that. What we did find in the white paper, and I think I remember having this conversation with this council a year ago was that we saw that these opt-in rates vary considerably by institution. And I think there was a member on this council, I, I told the story if it was this, that had a 95% opt-in rate, um, but then only charged a $5 overdraft fee, which I thought was, well, that makes sense, perhaps. Um, but we see these rates anywhere from the single digits to you know, the 80, 90% range, and it varies quite a bit. Um, but I think as Marcus and other other people here have made the comments um, on the on the transactions. It's there's you know you have people like you say that use their debit card a lot, and when they when they use it, they generally use it a lot. It's every little thing. They don't carry any cash. They don't run anything. So every two dollar purchase, every ten dollar you know would be one. Whereas if you carried cash, you might have one ATM transaction in a week, you know and um, and then you pay everything out of that, theoretically. Um, and the former gives you a lot of theoretical opportunities to overdraft. The latter would only give you one, because the bank's only seen one, or the credit union's only seen one. So the, the, those, those, those behavioral patterns definitely come into play, as well as the consumer choices. Let me just clarify. The, the, the results I'm showing today come from analysis of account, yeah. of account data, where we do know the opt-in status. Uh, and I think for in, in for the study banks, it's in the high teens of of um, the account holders are opted in. Uh, for the consumer interview research that Gary was referring to, um, I, yeah, as he was saying I, we don't know offhand what, what what share of consumers there would say they're opted in. I think one thing that's been that's been found in some survey work that's been done by others is that um, if you ask people, they they often don't know whether they're opted in or not. So just to summarize some of the discussion, by the way, this is typical excellent discussion from this council. You know, within an hour, you've surfaced some of the major issues that we are grappling with, including, uh, you know, how do these products actually work? How are they evolving in tandem with payment 
products evolving over time. What are the alternatives to these products? What are, what are the benefits of these products and how are they actually used by consumers as opposed to uh, th just the cost uh, numbers and the like? We have not settled on any particular policy judgments yet. So this discussion is quite timely. We try to make these discussions uh, timely. Uh, as you can see from Gary and Jesse's presentation, there's quite a bit of analysis being done and we're trying to wrestle through that and there were a lot of good suggestions today about uh, other vantage points we might take on some of that. Uh, going back to your original question, Rose, as to why, why we uh, began looking at this in the first place, I think, I think uh, Gary laid that out pretty well. I mean, this is, when you look at deposit accounts, which are one of the markets we look at, this is uh, the biggest driver of, of fee income on deposit accounts, so it's something worth looking at and understanding and knowing about. Uh, there's also the fact, as Gary noted, that uh, guidance on this issue to this day, at this moment, is inconsistent among the regulators, which is never a very happy place uh, to land. Uh, and so it certainly seemed that uh, re-looking at that, now that we have one bureau that can cut across banks and credit unions and, and thrifts uh, and, and, and even non-banks, so that's less relevant to a product like this. Uh, we are looking at uh, a variety of cash management products, uh, including uh, overdraft, small dollar loans, prepaid cards, uh, and, and uh, trying to think about this somewhat uh, holistically. Um, but the other, the other thing I would say is the experience that some of you have laid out in terms of your institutions today is, is in many ways maybe considerably different from some of the larger institutions. One, th one thing we have seen as we've examined larger institutions is you see, and it's not sim simply in this market, it's a variety of markets where uh, one of the dynamics that can emerge is that there are third-party vendors and others who come to the institutions with various plans and, and uh, you know, sales promotions, I can get you more revenue if you do X or Y, which is always of, of some interest in your for-profit business. You've got to pay attention to those things. Uh, what we're trying to emphasize is when that happens, you need to think carefully about what you're doing to consumers and are you treating them fairly, and there may be costs that you don't see up front that are going to come down the road. Uh, the other indicators here for us have been you know, a fair amount of litigation, particularly over the transaction reordering, which was one of the revenue enhancing techniques that uh, vendors took to certain institutions. Uh, and in some of those, uh, some of those areas, more co consumer confusion than you're indicating you're having uh, at some of your institutions. So these, these are all uh, fair, fair points, things for us to be thinking about, thinking about uh, uh, pretty carefully all of which will lead us to decide what to do here, if anything. Uh, I think I've already said, and I'll say it again, uh, you know, this courtesy product, this is not something the Consumer Bureau will be looking to ban. There may be some aspects of it that are problematic, some ways in which it has been executed that are problematic. Uh, we, w we will look at, look at those things, but, uh, uh, you know, Overdraft has, has been a product that is useful in, in many ways for a lot of consumers. Uh, but again, uh, for us to understand uh, how this works. And even the opt-in requirement that the Fed imposed in 2010, uh, we've been interested to see how that may play out differently at different institutions. And it can play out very differently in terms of how you market around whether your consumers opt in or opt out. Uh, so that's another piece of this that we're interested in. But uh, it's, a, it's a good subject for us. It's a fair subject. Uh, it does fairly quickly lead to a lot of uh, questions and analytical considerations, and uh, as you can see, our folks are very carefully working it through uh, in what I regard as a very intelligent way, but we're not at the end of that process yet. Thank you, Director Cordray. Um, Gary and Jesse, we certainly respect the work that you're doing, um, very much so. I thought it was a great dialogue. We could probably go on for a long time on this subject. <laughs> it's pretty passionate, as you can see. Um, but. I'm sure many of us would invite and welcome you to study our programs and credit unions and how we get, get to the ODP program, because you may find that there are very vast differences between us and the other guys. So again, thank you so much for the work. Um, we look forward to more information coming out. And if you could um, get into some credit unions and see how we do it, I think we would very much appreciate that. Yeah, and let, me, let me add, too, that uh, some of you were reacting sort of off the top of your head to a presentation you just saw today. Uh, for all of you who are interested, or your staffs or others or your colleagues, 
uh, have them go back, take a look at the white paper, think about it, you know, give us more developed thoughts if, as you have them. Some of you may have already done that, I'm, I'm aware. Uh, and anybody out there uh, paying attention to the meeting or thinking about it uh, and interested in the subject, we are keen to hear from people about different vantage points, different perspectives, different thoughts. Uh, we want to feel that we've covered the waterfront and thought things through uh, in, in dealing with these types of issues. We welcome any invitations if you we'd be glad to come down and visit you <laughs> all right yeah, yeah. excellent <laughs> we won't let you go well thank you all appreciate it so to dovetail off of this discussion we're going to now have scott pluta who um, is going to talk to us about the initiative on the consumer complaint side and the proposal that is is coming forth and i'm sure that there's going to be a lot of discussion on this front as well thank you scott Okay, I'll just use this one. <clears throat> I don't know. No, no, you've been Senate one. confirmed. I feel like I should let you have your own. Uh, okay. Okay, perfect. Um, is that is the deck ready to go? Can people see the deck, and do they have materials in front of I'm them? I'm saying I should never have had a microphone until I was confirmed. <laughs> I'm. No, I they can see that. I'll say that. Okay, everyone can see it. Good. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see some of you again. I know we had orientation yesterday, uh, and, and uh, we chatted. I was on my way walking up here, and a member of my staff asked me why I was dressed like a government bureaucrat, um, and so I nailed it, apparently. So uh, thank you uh, to my staff for, um, you know. You didn't take your microphone away. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So I'm here this afternoon to talk a little bit about a, a proposed policy uh, that uh, my office and the Bureau is putting forward and relates to a piece of the, the function that my office does. Um, some of the folks, again, in the room um, heard a little bit about this yesterday. Um, so some of it will be rehashing. There's going to be uh, get into it in much greater detail. Um, and then also at the front end, uh, for those uh, who weren't in the orientation yesterday, I thought it was really important to make sure that I provide some, uh, some grounding um, in what my office does and what that looks like before launching into um, the, an expansion um, of part of the operation. So uh, the first piece, just to ground everyone in what my office does, so I run the Office of Consumer Response. Uh, we do three things. We answer questions, we handle complaints, and we share data. On the answering questions side, it's broken into two pieces. We have a call center and we have an online presence. So the call center, we actually have two call centers. We've got one in Iowa and one in New Mexico. Uh, they're open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. every day, Monday through Friday except holidays. Um, and you can call, anyone in the U.S. can call, and they can ask questions. Uh, what is an APR? Can a bank do this? How do overdraft fees work? Um, I, I see that you did an enforcement action today. How does that impact me? Um, so you can go and you can pick up the phone, you can call, or you can go online. We have a product uh, that we partner with uh, Consumer Education and Engagement called Ask CFPB, and the same exact content that is available uh, through the phone is available online. Um, the second thing that we do is we handle complaints. So. We talked about this yesterday a little bit. You know, everyone in this room has credit cards, student loans, mortgages, credit lines, uh, or credit reports. Um, sometimes things go wrong. Things go off the rails. And um, you, know, you, you call the company. The vast majority of folks, when they have issues with their, their financial products and services, they'll call the company. I know the survey work that we've done, we know that 85% of the people that come to us um, have already gone to the company. Um, I was on a webinar about a year ago that uh, American Banker put on. There was a gentleman from Deloitte there. He had conducted a study, and what he found was that, on average, uh, every time a consumer comes to the Bureau, they had already gone to the company on that specific issue on average three times. Um, so, you know, first instance, things happen. The, the people generally go to the company and try and resolve them. The vast majority of the time, uh, that issue gets resolved at the company level. Um, there are, however, times when the consumer goes to the company, they feel like something's wrong, um, and the company decides for whatever reason that it's not going to get fixed. At that point, historically, uh, the consumer is kind of stuck. Um, there are a few avenues they can take. They can write their congressman. Um, they can go onto social media. Uh, potentially, they can hire a lawyer to the extent they have a private right of action. But really, at the end of the day, um, the vast majority of cases, the consumer basically has to uh, just deal with that issue themselves. 
Well, uh, Dodd-Frank, uh, one of the statutory charges the Bureau has is to collect and monitor and respond to consumer complaints. So now the consumer has an additional avenue that they can go to um, if they truly believe that there's something wrong with the, the interaction they had with the company. Um, and the Bureau, uh, as, as the regulator of these financial institutions, can, um, can get a response for them. So the third thing we do uh, is the, you know, the answering the questions piece and the handling complaints piece leads into the analyze and share data. So each of those things generates an awful lot of data for us. Uh, each and every contact we have with the American consumer, uh, the director often talks about this mosaic effect. That is, each and every one of these is a, is a pixel in that mosaic, and the more pixels we have, uh, the more clear picture we have of what's going on in real time in the consumer financial marketplace in the United States. Um, so just lots of data. The picture that we have forming is getting better and better. Um, the, the sharing data piece is, as that picture gets better, we have the ability to share our insights, share that picture with partners we have both inside and outside the building. So I'll get into some of the specifics a little later, but outside the building, uh, for the first time ever at the state or federal level, uh, the Bureau uh, shares individual level complaint data. And I'll show you a visualization of that later. Uh, we also share data with our government partners. So right now uh, we have a, a tool called the Government Portal. On that, uh, government agencies and AGs can sign up uh, and we will share with them the complaint data that we have for them in their jurisdiction. So to the extent that we get a complaint and it may implicate some type of state law issue, they have the ability to go in and get a more fulsome picture of what's going on in their jurisdiction. Uh, we have partners inside the building that we share data with. So uh, our rules, markets, and research, our, our partners in CEFL, supervision, enforcement, and fair lending, consumer education engagement, we share with all those parties. Um, frankly, our principal consumer of data inside the building is supervision, enforcement, and fair lending. So you know, supervision has finite resources. They can't be in all banks at all times. They have to make choices about who they go uh, and uh, examine. Um, part of their process to prioritize who they go talk to uh, relies on our complaint data. So it's very important there. Um, obviously, to the extent some enforcement actions, uh, potentially their genesis is in complaint data that we receive, um, that bears itself out. And then, of course, fair lending uh, on both fronts. So moving on to the next slide, um, as you can see from our mission statement, um, the three things that we do is embedded up front. And then obviously the reason that we do those things, uh, which is to level the playing field and empower consumers to take more control over their financial lives. So very important question, what is a complaint? I try as much as possible to get outside DC and meet with credit unions and meet with banks and talk to them about how they handle feedback, how they handle complaints. One of the first questions I always ask is, well, how do you define a complaint? Um, some have very narrow definitions. Some have very broad definitions. Our definition uh, is based on the OCC's definition, so to the extent folks are familiar with that, uh, but it is a fairly broad definition, and folks can read it, but in essence, it is an expression of dissatisfaction with a product or service over which we have jurisdiction over a financial institution over, we have, uh, over which we have jurisdiction. Um, the complaint process, just very quickly, um, it's somewhat unique. So if you, you know, when I first arrived at the Bureau about three and a half years ago and we did some research to figure out, well, what would our complaint handling process look like? We looked at the prudential regulators, we looked at NCUA, we looked at OCC, FTC, um, uh, the FAD, uh, FDIC. We looked at the private sector and we went and met with eBay and a bunch of companies like that to see, okay, well, how does the private sector do this? And then we made some decisions about process and staffing, et cetera. So our process is in some ways a hybrid. Uh, we always knew that we would have very high complaint volumes. I know these, these numbers are slightly dated. But in 2011, uh, the NCUA, Fed, FDIC, and the OCC respectively had 369 and I think 70,000 complaints. Uh, this year we are trending towards 275 to 300,000 complaints. Uh, last year was in the hundreds of thousands of complaints or 100,000 complaints, uh, 150 I think. The year before that was about 70. Um, we anticipate, based on the modeling that we've done, uh, that we'll probably end somewhere between half a million and a million complaints coming to the door every year. I expect to get there probably in the next three to five years. Um, one of the indicators that we look at to do that modeling, uh, our partners in CE have done a study on brand recognition. Um, what they found was that the CFPB's unaided brand recognition uh, is 0%. Uh, it's not that it's literally zero, it just rounds down to zero, and that's without any kind of aiding. So we know that a lot of folks out there don't know the services that we can provide as the CFPB's name gets out there more and more. Um, it's not that we are trying to drive volume, it's that 
you know, you know, our kind of one of our mantras is that citizens in this country shouldn't have access to services simply because they don't know about them. And so we want people to be in a position where if they want to use our services, it's not that they have to or we're trying to get them to, but they have that as an option in their toolkit as they're navigating their financial life. So thinking about the complaint process that we have, again, it's a hybrid between a high volume, low touch model, which is what the FTC has. They simply collect data. And they're very upfront about it and they make it available through FTC Sentinel and a kind of low volume, higher touch model, which the prudential regulators have adopted. So the front end is fairly automated and then the back end is the kind of high touch piece. So it begins with complaint intake. So consumers can submit complaints to us on a range of products, which we'll get to in a second. They can do so through the mail. They can do so through web, uh, which is about 50% of our intake. They can do fax, um, which I'm surprised that people still use fax machines. Um, they can get through, company, through referral. So other regulators get complaints for us, and they refer it over to us. That's about, I think, 20, 25% of our volume. Uh, and then lastly, through phone. About 10% of our complaints come through the phone channel. Uh, I mentioned this yesterday. As we were thinking about making the phone channel available, it's a very expensive channel. Folks in this room that run call centers know that every minute on the phone is, is our dollars. Um, but when we look at the FCC's broadband penetration study on who has access to broadband, we saw that a lot of our wheelhouse constituencies, minorities, poor, uh, elderly, uneducated, uh, rural, so that um, don't have access to broadband uh, as, as much as kind of others do. So having an open phone channel, very important to us. So we intake the complaint, um, we have an intake staff, they look at it, they say, is this a duplicate? Um, if it is, we merge it into another record. Is this something we have jurisdiction over? For example, if this is flood insurance, that's something the FDIC covers, we send it to them. And then lastly, does this have all the elements required that we need to, to process this as a complaint? For, for example, does it have a, a bank? Does it have you know, the person's name, contact info, things like that? If all those conditions are met, we then send it, uh, hopefully, you know, automated as much as possible. Frankly, half our cases get auto-routed. We're trying to become much more efficient in that space over to the company. Um, so we've got about 3,500 companies signed up right now on our secure web channel. So you know, the perfect scenario is someone submits a complaint over the web, uh, our auto-routing picks it up, and within seconds it gets sent to the institution. The institution in the third box has the company response piece. Uh, there's statutory obligations with respect to response. They have to do so in a timely manner. Um, 1034B of Dodd-Frank Act has some requirements for those responses. What have you done thus far? What do you plan on doing? And what communications have you had thus far with the consumer? So they do that. They've got 15 days to provide a substantive response. They have 60 to close. So it's all very uh, uh, regimented. Um, most of the products, uh, they close relatively quickly. So for example, credit card is usually closed within two or three days. Um, some of the products such, uh, such as mortgage, which is uh, an international money uh, 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 transfer, um, can be much more drawn out either because of documentation or, or cycle times. And that can get to the 15 day mark. They ask for an extension, they get up to 60 days. Um, when they close a complaint, they put it into one of four buckets to get some structured data out of it so we can share through the public database, which we'll get to in a second. Was it closed with monetary relief? Was it closed with non-monetary relief? Was it closed with explanation or was it just closed? The Bureau doesn't pass any judgment whatsoever on any of those four buckets. Um, so you know, we're, we, do, we are not uh, advocating on behalf of the consumer for uh, credit unions or, or um, banks or non-banks to provide customer service gestures. We're simply collecting structured data at that point on how the case was closed or the complaint was closed. From that point, once it gets closed by the company, it goes to the consumer. So we allow the consumer to provide some feedback to us on how the complaint handling experience was. Are you satisfied essentially with the, the response you've gotten uh, from the company? At that point, for all intents and purposes, the consumer facing piece of our complaint only process is done. You can see that a lot of it is automated. Obviously there are a lot of exceptions and there's some human touch and work that has to go into there. But in order to scale to half a million to a million complaints, that first piece has to be, frankly, highly automated, minimizing exceptions. Then moving into the last two pieces of the complaint process, they are less linear than they suggest on the slide. The review and investigations piece, so some element of my staff all day, every day, they are tearing through complaints looking for legal violations. Obviously, when they find things, whether they're technical legal violations like TILA RESPA or things that drift into the UDAP territory, those are then bundled uh, and packaged and handed over to supervision enforcement and fair lending, like I talked before. And then the analyze and report. So those are those two things are commingled, and obviously the public database piece, which I'll get to in a second. 
So these are the complaints that we accept right now. You can see we did so in a, a rolled out fashion. We started with credit card. It was the simplest product uh, to start with. Um, you know, 90% of the waterfront is covered by 10 institutions. Transactions are fairly easy uh, to sort out. Um, and so we started with that. We moved into the balance of the non-bank products. So we moved to mortgages, bank accounts, et cetera. And then at some point we transitioned to the non-bank things that we cover. So you can see uh, credit reporting, money transfers, debt collection, payday lending. In July, uh, we launched prepaid cards and a few other things. And, uh, you know, the, the fact is that as financial innovation continues into the future, uh, we will continue to roll out new products. So you can see there, uh, virtual currency came out in October 2014. Uh, think virtual currency, you're thinking things like Bitcoin. Um, I think we've probably gotten a very, 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 uh, very low volume of Bitcoin complaints thus far. Um, but as we move into this world, you know, today eBay announced that they were spinning off PayPal. You've got the Apple uh, payment issue. Um, as you move into that kind of innovative space, uh, I assume we're going to continue to see new products pop up. And obviously then we'll have to start uh, doing complaint intake for those products. Uh, you, sorry, you can see at the bottom, we've handled north of 400,000 complaints thus far. So to give you an idea of what we're seeing, how it falls against product and also the channels, I mentioned some of these numbers earlier. Web is the biggest uh, ref uh, channel, and then referral phone is 10%. You can see the breakdown. Uh, mortgage for a long time was our number one issue. Um, as non-bank products have come into the scene, those have started to take bigger pieces of the pie. You can see debt collection is obviously a very big piece, and uh, credit card and credit reporting big pieces. <clears throat> I would anticipate... Um, kind of moving into the future that mortgage will probably shrink as a as a, a, a share of the, the pie, and you'll see probably debt collection and credit reporting uh, get to be bigger pieces. So how do, you, how do consumers interact with us? Uh, here's our homepage, which I talked about yesterday, I think is uh, one of, if not the best, uh, web page in the federal government. Um, our phone number is in the upper right-hand corner. You can call that. You can get to the contact center, which I mentioned. Um, some of the headlines there, if you click on Get Assistance, you can go to the Ask CFBB product and go to the knowledge base. And then on the right there, you see Submit a Complaint. So very easy to get in touch with us. So here is a visualization um, of the, the public database, which we'll talk about in a second. It is, as I said yesterday, kind of beautiful in its simplicity and transparency. In essence, it is an Excel spreadsheet. So running down, the, you know, each row represents an individual complaint, an individual consumer that has come to us. And then you can see the various data fields uh, running to the right. I think there's somewhere between 13 and 15 now. So product, sub-product, issue, sub-issue. The day we received it, the day we sent it to the bank, you know, that is an efficiency metric that we measure ourselves on, and over time you will have seen that come down. Uh, the name of the institution is, is there, whether or not they met their 15 or 60 day statutory obligation uh, with respect to a response. The zip code to the extent that people want to crunch data based on uh, uh, geography. <clears throat> and then um, I think dispute is the, uh, another column, which is whether or not at the end of the day the consumer provided feedback indicating to us that they wanted to in some way dispute the resolution of the company or, or the response. So what we'll talk about in a second is, and you can imagine visually, there would be a, an additional column. So at the end of these columns, there'll be one more column, and that would be, or I guess a couple of columns, um, a narrative provided by the consumer and then a narrative provided by the company in response. So, oh. so I'm going to intervene here to say two things. Uh, we're now going to get to the issue of consumer complaint narratives. But I want to just stress one thing, uh, and, and Scott's awkward for him to say it. You can imagine that when we opened our doors back in July of 2011, uh, very understaffed and very preliminary in terms of anything we were doing, this whole consumer complaint function that was mandated by Congress for us to handle was a pretty uh, daunting task. And we had no idea what the volumes would be and the difficulty in actually handling this and handling it well loomed large. Uh, Scott's team, the consumer response group, about 150 odd now, has been one of the highest performing teams at the Bureau. You can see how thoughtful and well put together this process has been, drawing on what we, the best we could find in the public and private sectors and going beyond it in many ways. Uh, it has become central to the Bureau because we do and we make no bones about it. It's very public that we look at complaints and when there were just a few and they were only in a few areas, it wasn't very helpful. But now that we get many, 
across the board. It in influences our choices about what to do in our enforcement actions, our supervisory work, uh, our regulatory work. And so it behooves, and we stress this all the time, uh, industry out there to pay attention themselves to our complaints. That's part of the beauty of having a public complaint database. They can see what we see and they can act accordingly. They don't have to wait on us and they can fix problems. So it's become very central to the Bureau. The other thing I wanted to just ground here for the members of the Council uh, is all of what we're describing with respect to the credit unions on this panel is hypothetical with respect to you because none of you are within our jurisdiction of being having 10 billion in assets or more. So the complaints that we might receive with respect to any of you, we would pass on to, I guess, to NCUA. We, so everything we're talking about here is hypothetical and not actual with respect to you all. Nonetheless, we'll be interested in your feedback and thoughts about as we move on to the complaint narratives, which is a policy decision in front of us at the moment, whether you have insight or thoughts uh, about it. But I just wanted to make that clear <clears throat> to the extent you were sitting there worrying about how this affects you. Uh, in fact, it doesn't. So. Uh, so thank you. But you can still pay attention. To yes. That. Yeah. You can still pay attention to the complaints you see, so that you can make sure you're not having those problems yourselves, which is which is a great educative function of this this whole project. So <laughs> it's hard to follow. Uh, <laughs> so um, and, and and the director raises a good point, and I, I should have said that from the outset. Again, uh, very clear. This is this is pointed towards institutions with assets of ten billion dollars or greater. Or, or the non banks. Um, yeah, or the non banks. Um, so um, this is actually what is in the consumer complaint database. So you'll see not every product is in there right now, the virtual currency and the prepaid and other. Those aren't in yet. What we like to do is launch the product, wait 90 to 120 days, make sure that the data that we're getting in the door is appropriate for publication as a product. Um, and then once we decide, yes, everything is functioning as we thought, um, then we publish that. So at some point b before the end of the year, we'll be releasing uh, the, the complaints that we have on our most recent release. Um, releases. So now at this point to pivot to the proposed policy that the Bureau announced uh, in mid-July, um, I think we'll walk through it a little bit and then I'll turn it over. I think we'll get some feedback and then also uh, pr uh, you know, make myself available and obviously the director will answer questions uh, on the policy. So as you can see on the slide in front of you, uh, very technical. Um, and I can't really read it because of the light, but um, so the Bureau uh, published a notice in mid-July about expanding the database that I showed you. There's the title, the docket number, and the common period, which closed about a week ago Monday. Uh, the pro proposed policy would supplement the Bureau's existing policy statements establishing and expanding the consumer complaint database. Uh -huh. So consumers who submit a complaint will be given the opportunity to give consent to the Bureau to publish his or her complaint narrative. So again, very, very, very important to us uh, and, you know, you know, two of the big issues that we wrestled with inside the Bureau before we even proposed the policy um, were, you know, reputational risk uh, of, uh, you know, harm to the institution and the consumer privacy piece. Uh, the consumer privacy piece, we feel very strongly that this first bullet uh, goes directly to that issue, which is asking the consumer if they want to opt in. Um, obviously, a lot of people in here uh, know about the power of default. Um, so the default is typically what folks go with. So if you have an opt-in or an opt-out, that can be a very powerful thing as far as behavioral psychology goes. Um, we chose to go against the power of default so that consumers have to actively think about it and decide, yes, this is something I want to opt into. So I think very powerful, very important piece to say up front. The second piece is um, the, the opt-in consent will state, uh, among other things, and in plain language, that whether or not consent is given will have no impact on how we handle their complaint, very important. If it's given, they can withdraw consent at any time. We'll have a mechanism for that. And then also, uh, and very importantly, uh, the second piece of the privacy uh, issue, the CFP will take reasonable steps to remove personal information from the complaint to minimize, but obviously not eliminate the risk of re-identification. So I'm not sure, you know, obviously could have, uh, there's a lot of literature and research around this idea of re-identification, the ability to look into a data set, and even though it may not have the person's name, but through direct and indirect identifiers, figure out who that person actually is. Um, so we will take the narrative, uh, both the ones that the consumer provides and the one the company provides, and we will scrub it. In the policy, we have a standard, um, and I think we talk about it a little bit, um, but there's gonna be, a, there's a standard that's in the policy, and it said these are the types of things that we will scrub out. 
There are several policy, there are several standards out there, uh, both in the government and the private, that we could have adopted. Uh, the one that we've adopted hems uh, most closely to the HIPAA standard that they use when scrubbing uh, medical records. It's a very, very high standard. We scrub a lot of stuff out. Um, so that, but adopted for obviously a, a financial context. So that's the standard, it's a very strict standard. And then the methodology by which we scrub. So you take that standard and you apply it to the narratives and through uh, computers and humans, you're able to then scrub out uh, all these direct and indirect identifiers, making it extremely difficult, though not impossible, although very, very, very rare, um, to be able to re-identify consumers in the database. So complaints will continue to be published after the company responds or after it has uh, had the complaint for 15 calendar days, whichever comes first. So same uh, trigger that's in place right now. So um, we get a complaint, it goes in the public database the sooner of two things, either we get a substantive response from the company, so for example, it's a credit card complaint and they close it in two days, it goes up in two days. If we send it to a company and they take 15 days, we think that's, we've kind of decided that's long enough for them to decide whether or not that's their consumer. Um, if 15 days elapses, we don't hear back from them, it also goes up in the public database. If after 15 days they come back and they say, no, 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 that's not our consumer, um, then obviously it comes down, but we've decided internally 15 days is long enough. We are adopting that same time frame uh, for the publication of the narrative. Um, we'll get to in a second, but when the narrative goes up contemporaneously, the company's response would go up, so one wouldn't go before the other. So we'd only disclose consumer complaint narratives, again, for which consent has been obtained, and there's been a robust personal information scrubbing standard methodology applied. Companies would have the option to provide narrative text that would appear next to the consumer's narrative in the consumer complaint database. Again, the same standards for removing personal information would apply to company responses. And then I think this is last. Lastly, so we put the policy out. We got a lot of comments. The documents I have in front of me are related to that I'm going through right now. Um, there were three things in particular that we were looking for feedback on and would love to hear uh, this group's feedback on. One is consumer consent. Uh, where in the process should that take place? What are some things we should be sure to alert the consumer to with respect to giving consent? Two, the company response. What should that look like? Uh, what are the elements of that that you would suggest? Are there any thoughts you have on the company response piece? And then again, <clears throat> the, the personal information scrubbing standard methodology. Again, the standard is what are the things that we, what are the categories of things we scrub out? The methodology is how do we go about doing that? What's the, what's the process that we go against um, to actually scrub the data out of those narratives? So with that. Um, how many responses did we get? So we got, there's kind of two buckets of responses. Uh, we've got uh, PERG uh, did a campaign and uh, was able to get about 30,000 effectively form letters uh, submitted in favor of the policy. Um, we've got about 100 and I think 20 or 30 comments. I would say about half of them are from some type of entity. The other half are from individuals. Of the half from entities, the way it's broken out, as far as I can tell right now, kind of companies and trade associations related to those companies have generally come out um, against the policy. Some have, are fairly moderate. Um, a lot of them have very good suggestions. On the other side, those kind of in favor and with suggestions, uh, one of the trade associations for the newspaper, so Dow Jones uh, Wall, um, and those News Corp and those folks, their trade association submitted something in favor. Uh, several consumer groups, uh, including the umbrella organization AFR, submitted. I saw that. They, they thought we should disclose everything regardless of whether consumers consent, right? Yeah. Yes. They are firm believers in FOIA. Um, and uh, so consumer groups, uh, open government, kind of transparent government groups, and frankly, privacy groups uh, have come out in favor. Obviously, the privacy groups, I think about four or five of the, the kind of biggest nationally recognized privacy groups in this area came out in favor, um, but obviously with heavy suggestions. Um, they, want, they want to see this done, um, but obviously they're very, they're very uh, thoughtful about the <coughs> privacy aspect of it. So that's the kind of trend that I've seen thus far in going through the comments. Next steps, obviously, we'll go through them, summarize them, provide responses, and at some point, to the extent the director decides to move forward with the policy, um, any adjustments would be made to that and would be published. We don't have a time frame right now on when that all is going to take place. Um, it depends on um, the size of the work, the, the, you know, all the comments we got in, and also, frankly, internal decision making and, and that process. Um, so with that, I want to open it up, maybe turn, turn the mic back. Scott, I had an opportunity to speak with you on the phone in a conference call on this. Uh, we, uh, at my credit, my board accepts comments directly from our membership. And just to share that experience, what often happens is the member comes out of the box with a full head of steam on something, 
and it, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty uh, edgy. <laughs> and um, often, though, and maybe this is where the 15 days comes in, it turns out that perhaps the member uh, it was missing some money from an ATM transactions, maybe some ACH transactions. Turns out their son got a hold of their ATM card and they had shared their PIN number. It's embarrassing for all concerned. And um, so what I would tell you uh, from our experience, and, and, and we've been doing this for four years now, so there's many, many of these examples, is, um, and I think most credit are like this, we're not going to go out in that comment section and say anything disparaging about that member or their family. It's just not in our DNA or our culture. Recognizing that we could, you're allowing us to do that and you're protecting the privacy, but it's just not the type of thing that we're likely to do. So then it makes you question, what is the value uh, of, of, that, of, that ex, of that exchange? And it's very common, it's very common. And so it, it's, I think you use the language, something to the effect of, you know, is it, um, you know, is you know, is it? Uh, can it be fixed? It's these aren't necessarily things that are broken. They're they're exchanges of information that probably are better, you know, handled between the financial institution and their member. Um, and granted, there's others that are not that are more are legitimate. But I, I just I caution you that there's there's a fair amount of that out there, and we we wouldn't put that type of information in our comments section. I have a quick comment. I gotta I gotta run. First of all. Very good work, I'm impressed. Um, so good, keep up the good work. Um, one of the things I would caution you on, and maybe you've already recognized this, is that database of narrative will be very valuable. If it's disclosed publicly, there will be firms that download it and use it. So I'm sure you're aware of that. But that, as that value increases, the incentive for people to populate the database is gonna increase as well. We regard that as a good thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Scott? Uh, just two questions. Yep. Uh, it looks like the end of this whole process where you're scrubbing narratives and, and doing all is very manual, maybe uh, you know, takes a lot of time. Are you concerned that a lot of consumers are going to opt in and you're going to have to add a lot of staff just to do that portion? And also the second question <clears throat> is you mentioned that you're going to break it out by credit card complaints, mortgages, and other. Is it going to be further broken out by institutions, so if I'm shopping for a new credit card, I can look at Capital One complaints, <coughs> Bank of America complaints, and those types of things, kind of like an <coughs> Angie list, Angie's List type of uh, consumer review? Um, <clears throat> uh, so thanks for those questions. So on the first one, the cost. So we're actually going to be scrubbing all the narratives we get, whether, whether or not the con So <clears throat> the Bureau takes privacy very seriously. Um, there are privacy issues inside and outside the building. So these complaints that we get are absolutely full of the consumer's very personal information. So it's got their name, sometimes their social security number, their account number, what happened to them. Oftentimes in narratives, they will put medical conditions they have. There's all kinds of stuff there. As I talked, we want to share that stuff inside the building as much as we possibly can because it helps folks do their jobs. At the same time, there are certain elements of those complaints that folks inside the building don't need to know. So we're going to be scrubbing. We're setting up operation to scrub all narratives. So while we're sharing it with someone in enforcement or supervision, they may not need to know the Social Security number or the medical condition or whatever that this individual has. So as far as kind of cost goes, we're going to amortize that across all complaints that we get. But you raise a very, very good point, which is at some point when volume, you know, volume times cost per complaint equals potentially a big number. Uh, the ability for computers to scrub Direct identifiers, that is the things, you know, numbers, names, account numbers, all that stuff, the stuff that helps you directly identify people, um, they're very, very good at. So you can run that through a computer, 99.99%, they'll scrub it out. The tough part gets with the indirect identifiers. So let's say we've got the zip code in one column and the person wrote in their narrative, you know, I've been, the, I've been the fire chief for five years here in kind of Greenfield, Wisconsin, and, you know, I broke my leg last year, whatever. So those things that you know you just normally wouldn't be able to read and say I know who this is. Once you start providing other clues like zip code and some of the things, eventually someone will be able to figure out who that is. And those are indirect identifiers. Computers are not very good at scrubbing those out. So um, not to get too far into the methodology of how we'll be scrubbing this, because frankly, 
the more you disclose your methodology, the easier it is for people who are outside the building and want to re-engineer it and identify folks gets easier. So a little bit ambiguous about that. But I would suspect that the amount of eyeballs on the public-facing narratives would be higher than the things that we share inside the building, I think, for obvious reasons. Um, and so, you know, yes, there's a concern about cost. I think the methodology we're putting together will capture that. Um, but that's obviously something we're going to monitor. But as of right now, I uh, feel pretty good about the cost constraints on this, on this initiative. The second thing is already in the public database, um, there is a column that has the name of the institution. So today you can go and you can sort and you can see which companies have the most complaints, both in absolute terms, and you could do some normalization. Um, obviously, to the extent that the narrative is available, um, that will then become part of, you know, text analytics would then be, become part of that analysis by company potentially. Let me just add that uh, what Scott describes, uh, automating some of the scrubbing, really wouldn't have been possible probably as, as recently as 10 years ago, maybe five years ago. There's been a lot of technology that's developed around things like HIPAA, the Medical Privacy Act, where they want to find ways to have information be useful but scrub out the kind of things that create legal uh, issues. So this has made leaps and bounds. But it's also, again, it's a reflection, I want to say again, about Scott's team. Uh, they face problems and challenges every day. Uh, to get to this point. I mean, it's remarkable what they've done in three years. When I was Attorney General of Ohio, we had a complaint response function that was quite rudimentary, and they'd been at it for decades, decades. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we, will, we will work this through. The other thing I want to say is we're trying to be very careful. We are very careful about privacy. There are plenty of consumers who come to the database, and they're quite happy to be public. They don't mind being identified. Many of them are also people who might go and talk to their newspaper or their local television station and have a story on the air about how they felt they were mistreated and, and what happened with it. So uh, yeah, there's a certain number of consumers here who are pretty hardy, and, and this won't even affect, but we're going to be l looking at privacy regardless of, of what their own uh, outlook or temperament might be about that. Jason? Can you speak to your uh, the overall value of making this t out to the public and then what y'all's intentions are specifically to bringing this out to the public, especially when it's going to be so scrubbed. I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, right now, we already have in our, we already have a public complaint database that Scott described. You can already go there and, for example, as you said, there's some value in being able to go and look at uh, institution A or institution B. What kind of problems do you see? What kind of concerns do you have? Do I want to do business with that institution? You know, again, if it was just a handful of complaints, you might feel pretty skeptical about whether it's worth bothering. But if there's many, then you start to get a sense that there's a certain pattern at this institution that doesn't seem to be the same pattern as another institution. And the more data we have, the, the better filled in that picture as this got aptly uh, described. Similarly, if right now all of that is still broken down in fairly generic categories, though. You know, it's just, just not as descriptive as, as having the detail around what actually happened to someone uh, and what the problem really was. Uh, the other thing is, and when we did a panel on this, we did a field hearing on this a couple months ago, uh, there were some industry folks who, who made a point to say more detail often creates more credibility. Anybody can give a generalized, you know, s somebody stinks or somebody isn't doing a good job. That doesn't mean anything. Nobody can make much of that. If there's more detail, you can really get a sense of whether that seems to be a legitimate problem or not. Uh, so in, in that respect, it's helpful. It also, it's more vivid. It's just more vivid. You know how it is. If you draw a conclusion in the abstract as opposed to you tell a story around somebody's real life event, uh, it's just different. And, and by the way, Scott didn't mention, but there are two agencies of the federal government that have already been doing this for some time. Uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, you can go to their website and you can look at the narratives of complaints people have about particular vehicles. I've, I've looked at my own car. It was a little bothersome because <laughs> there were some problems with uh, the generic make. I haven't had them myself, but it makes you, makes you think. Uh, and the Consumer Product Safety Commission, an analog to us, but not for financial products, for general products like toys and toasters and cribs, uh, they, they put up the narratives. So it's, it's already being done in some elements of the federal government. This is, we are not the first ones to cross the Rubicon here and do something brand new. So uh, again, we, we, we're at a stage where we have just gotten a lot of public comment. 
certain amount of consternation in some quarters. We will digest all of that and think hard about it, but these are the reasons why we move forward with a proposal in the first place, and we will see where we go from here without prejudging it. But those were some of the thoughts that were in our mind as we started in on this. I don't know if you want to add anything. You've been the one that's uh, thought most carefully about this. Uh, no, not at all, um, as, as usual. Um, very good. Scott, have you given any thought to assisting in screening some of the complaints at the entry level of the website? And I haven't, uh, and I apologize, I have not viewed it. But, uh, and what I'm uh, referring to would be uh, you are the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and there are many consumers and who would think that any complaint that they would have, even uh, an employee of an institution might feel that they could follow, you know, bring a complaint to you where it would be best served at uh, maybe EEOC or some other place. So uh, is there any disclaimers or any, uh, any information at the beginning of the process that sure. would help people <laughs> to know that they could go to another place or, or, or another place? portal might be a better choice for that complaint? Right. So good question. Uh, we do get folks that call, so just through the contact center, um, we get folks that call us about a range of issues. Um, it's nice when you've got a human on the phone, you can go back and forth um, to the extent that we identify that this doesn't meet the definition. You know, This is just an inquiry. It's not a complaint. Then we answer their question. If it is a complaint um, and it meets our definition, uh, which is a dissatisfaction, then it goes down our complaint channel. If they're actually calling about EEOC or some other type of matters, we do our best to refer them to the other place. So at least through the phone, we're actually fairly effective at triaging what is ours and what isn't ours. The stuff that comes over the web and also you know, the mail and fax that gets digitized and goes into a universal queue, um, to the extent that it is, um, you know, we get it, we send it to the company. And the company has the chance to say before it goes up in the public database, before we start down this train, either hey, this isn't ours, this isn't our customer, which I think is a very important distinction between, you know, some of the comparisons have been made between what we do and potentially what some private sector actors do. Um, one of the issues they have is this kind of trolling where you have people who actually um, talk about products and services in restaurants and they never even actually use the product, service, or restaurant. So we do confirm, in fact, there is a commercial relationship there. So, you know, <clears throat> we get it, it's in our jurisdiction. It meets our definition of a complaint. It has everything we need to treat it as a complaint. We send it to the institution. They say, yes, this is our consumer. Um, so that is the kind of, um, that is the verification that we do for the complaint. And then at that point, um, you know, it goes on to the company. I, I've talked about this before. Um, so some, some folks have heard this, but one of the analogies uh, that I use to talk about our system um, is the airline industry. So everyone here has flown on an airplane. Um, everyone here has flown an airplane with a bag. Everyone here has flown an airplane with a bag and, and a bag has been lost. Um, and you just understand that. So airlines lose baggage. Everybody loses baggage and that's fine. There's, there's kind of judgments not passed on that. Everyone does that. What you don't want to be though is the airline that loses the most bags relative to your peers, right? So people lose bags, that's fine. You don't want to be the number one airline that loses the most bags. Second, when you lose a bag, you don't want to treat you want to you want to treat it like it is your mom's bag. Um, you don't want to treat it like it's the bag that belongs to the guy down the street who you don't like very much. Um, and so there's a difference there. So if you're a company and you pride yourself on customer service, and you get a complaint, and everyone gets complaints. You say, look, relative to my peers, I get less complaints than everyone else. And that's something that they, if they in fact are, if that's part of their business model, it's part of your business model. Um, you can, and you see this in the car industry, you can market on that. You can say, we got all these awards. We, you know, we have a fantastic product and we've been independently recognized. Um, and the second thing on, on the, how you treat the complaint, hey, when we get a complaint, like it's important to us and we will do everything we can to, sorry, we'll do everything we can to resolve this complaint. Um, and then consumers, when they're thinking about, well, gee, who should I do business with? And you can imagine the consumer that says, you know, things always go wrong for me. Like my bag always gets lost. It's like I know something's gonna go wrong. So as I'm thinking about a credit card company, I wanna go with somebody who I know if there's an issue, they'll be on top of it and they'll treat it like it's their mom's issue and not like it's the guy's issue down the street who they don't like very much. So, and so, but some consumers don't care about that. And in that case, they don't have to look at the database. They don't have to look at the data that comes out of it that people package and make more user-friendly. 
But to the extent that folks actually do value that and they're thinking about where to put their dollars and that's something that has value to them and they have certain expectations um, in making those decisions, then that's where I think this information closes the gap between what people are paying for and the customer service that they're expecting, particularly when things go wrong. Well, you basically answered, I, I was getting down to if someone does come in as a complaint against a credit union or a, a bank and it should be referred to FDIC or NCOA, how you would handle that. And I think you addressed that uh, well by phone, but what about uh, on the internet? Have you thought about uh, links uh, or the like that would uh, send them over that direction? So uh, that's a good question. Um, so right now when we get a complaint, um, we will identify it as belonging to another regulator and we'll send it along. Um, I, can, I can envision a place, you know, one of the, we did some survey work and what we found was, you know, people have a certain level of satisfaction with our process and one place where satisfaction just goes off a cliff is if it's a referral, uh, an incoming referral. I, I assume it, it mirrors going out. So just kind of being passed from one regulator to another causes a good 15 to 20% drop in satisfaction. So our ability uh, to, in the future, think of a way to, through kind of design, um, get the appropriate consumer to the appropriate regulator uh, instantaneously um, is, is, a, is a goal. Um, so right now, it's a little kludgy. We get the complaint. We refer it out. Others get their complaints. They refer it to us. I, in the future, just given that delta and consumer satisfaction, in my office, we have three goals. One of our goals is an amazing user experience. That's really important to us, uh, and so over time, that's something that we're gonna we're going to put resources against to try and fix. Thank you, Scott. Do we have any other questions for Scott? Sorry, Jason. Uh, Go ahead. I'm sorry, I, I was just gonna make a note. There's already a lot of places out there that you can go as a consumer and look at um, financial institutions. The BBB. I mean, they, a lot of credit unions have and financial institutions have Twitter accounts, Facebook. There's all, all those interactions already just kind of creating one more spot that somebody has to go monitor and make sure the response that gets going to be made public is um, politically correct, as uh, Marcus was saying earlier. So that was my thoughts. I just really have more of a suggestion on the layout. I think you said earlier, if some, if you, when you put the narrative out there, that the comment's going to be side by side. And I guess I would encourage that, that they are side by side, because people will only read the complaint, not read the response. And sometimes how you respond Tells the tells the consumer that that's really where I want to go. People do make mistakes, but that you know they handled it well and they're they're impressed with the response. So I just to, in all fairness, I think it would be good to lay them side by side. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you all. Um, it it sounds like Scott that we have the same mission uh, to deliver an awesome member experience, and so you're going to deliver an awesome consumer experience. So. Looks like we're side by side on that front, but thank you for your work. It's greatly appreciated. And as we wrap up today, um, and as you've seen today, uh, the Bureau staff is, is very interested in our perspectives, our views, and um, how we better the lives of our members and that we are different from the other folks. Um, really look forward to uh, this council's contributions and as we move forward with our initiatives. Thank you for traveling to DC. Um, I know time uh, from your shops is, is um, very precious to you, but the work that I think that we're doing here is, is benefiting our communities and our, and our members as well. I also want to thank uh, Director Cordray, Zixta, and Delicia for their leadership and for their time to giving us the opportunity to voice our perspectives. And I, I just think that that is just amazing. It's an honor um, for me to be here, as well as I'm sure for all of you, to be able to have the time of these folks and hopefully put the thumbprint on some policy-making decisions that come our way. So with that, um, travel safe. Um, we will see you next time. Thank you for the public for being here. And uh, we're all accessible, as you've heard. So if you have any, any thoughts or any comments between the time that we meet, please feel free to uh, reach out to Delicia. Also, myself and Kevin, um, emails or telephone calls, it would be great. So thank you very much, all, and have a, a great rest of the week and travel safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.